Amen. We're going to be diving into Acts chapter 8, all the way from verse 1 through 25. If you have your Bibles or your Bibles in your phones or iPads, feel free to take them out right now. Take notes, reread it at home. If you weren't here for Pastor Harry's uh, survey of chapter 7, please watch it online so that you can pick up where we are. I believe that today we have a word for those who have ever faced discomfort, for those who've ever faced persecution, for those who've ever faced pain. Now raise your hand if you have ever faced any of the three things that I mentioned. If you've ever faced persecution, if you've ever faced pain, if you've ever faced discomfort, or, or if you're in a situation of discomfort and pain and problems, raise your hand. I believe this word this morning is for you and for us as a church as we prepare for the calling of God. I want to start reading verse 1 and then verse 4. I will skip verses 2 and 3. It says that Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. If you want to know what that is about, read chapter 7 and watch Pastor Harry's message from last week. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem and all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. The name of this message is Bring It On. Everybody say, Bring It On. Bring it on. It's about the power of God in the midst of persecution. Tell the person next to you, this is about the power of God. It's not about your own power. I don't know if you've ever faced bullying or persecution, but in my life I've been bullied a few times. When I was in elementary school and middle school, I would be bullied by other kids because I was usually either one of the shortest or one of the better looking kids. And so people are usually jealous of those two things and I would be bullied. And I remember that I was facing these kids. Stop laughing at that. That hurts me a little bit. I was facing these kids that were bullying me over and over. And then uh, at one point, a friend from my neighborhood joined the school, and while we were in middle school, uh, he was actually a little different than the rest, because he was one of these weird kids that had gone through puberty when they were like five. I mean, this dude was tall and had a deep voice, and you know, I, I'm, I still don't have a super deep voice, so you can imagine the rut that I was at that moment. Well, he came into the school and decided, because I was his first friend at this school, that he was going to protect me. I remember how I realized that, though. He never told me this until I faced bullying and persecution at one moment. Uh, these kids that were, uh, that were bullying me approached me at one point, and they pushed me, and I fell to the ground, and I felt powerless. And tears began to fill my eyes, and I felt so stupid, except that at that moment, my friend stepped in between the two of us, and in all his might, he intimidated them. He was one of these teenagers that have a mean look. Have you, do you know how teenagers have a really, really mean look and intimidating? I'm 36, but I'm still afraid of teenagers. Uh, and, and, and it was one of those teenagers who had a really mean look. And so he intimidated them, and they tried to push him, but they themselves bounced back because he was so strong and so tall they couldn't really do anything against him. That's when I thought, oh, so now it's not about the power that I don't have. It's about the power of the one who is with me. Do you know that the church today has a problem understanding that it is not about our own power, but it is about the power of the one who is with us? That it is not about who we think we are or what we think we may have or how we think we may react. It is about the power of the one who defeated death so that we could have forgiveness and eternal life. But you see, because of the human condition, it takes us a while to realize that. And it took the early church a while to realize this. Back in chapter 1, verse 8 of the book of Acts, which is easy to remember in comparison with this verse in chapter 8, verse 1. Back in chapter 1, verse 8, we see Jesus, the all-powerful, who had already resurrected, giving the church a commission, giving them an order. And the order was, uh, go and make disciples of all nations, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. But now he's saying, go to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, proclaiming this message. All the way from chapter 1 through chapter 7, every event that we see happens in the region of Judea. It happens in Jerusalem. So while God is moving in great ways in this region, 
they still hadn't, uh, hadn't fulfilled the calling that he had given them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Because they had stayed in Judea. They still hadn't gone to Samaria or to the ends of the earth. And so persecution comes and it fills the church. People who are killing Christians like Saul, we're going to learn his story later on in this series, begin to kill Christians and to see these martyrs being killed and approving of those murders. The church begins to face persecution, but it is used for something. Now, when you think of uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, especially if you've been in the church for a while, you tend to think of these geographic concentric circles. And you tend to think of your Judea or the area where you live, your Samaria or the surrounding regions, and then the ends of the earth as other countries. And I think that's a good way of looking at it. However, I think there's another way of looking at it. Because every time you said Samaria and Judea, it was almost like saying a cuss word. Because it referred, or it's a word that represented a group of people who were considered unholy. Jewish people didn't mix up with Samaritans. The reason being that these Jewish people that lived in the region of Samaria had actually mixed up with other nations. They had uh, multicultural marriages and they were considered to be unholy. And so Jewish people didn't mix with them. They didn't have friends in the town, in the region of Samaria. And when Jesus said, go to Judea, all, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, all the followers said, yes, we will go to where we are at. That's easy. Then he said, go to Samaria. I'm pretty sure that they felt something. They felt that reaction down their spine. Because Samaria was not a region where they were comfortable in. Samaria was a region where they were uncomfortable in. If they, if they ever were to travel, they had to go around the region of Samaria to go to other places. That's how uncomfortable they were. It's almost like saying for us that you have to go to midtown or to downtown, but you also have to go to the inner city. Or that you have to go to your suburbs, but you also have to go to your areas where there's high crime, where there's poverty. Kind of like this zip code. It is not a place of comfort. And I believe that this was a way of Jesus saying, you're going to go to regions where you're comfortable. You're going to go to regions where you're uncomfortable. And then you're going to go to the ends of the earth. And you're going to proclaim my name, whether it's safe or whether it's dangerous, whether you are at peace or, or it's a place at war. You will go and proclaim my name wherever I want you to go. Now, the church didn't react in the best way. And so persecution was allowed. But we see right there in verse 4 that the believers were scattered and they preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. This is the first thing I want us to understand about this. Is that the good news of Jesus can turn persecution into rapid multiplication. Everybody say multiplication. multiplication. Now say it three times. Just to keep your mouths loose and keep you connected with the teaching. See, it, it, if we see this with our human hearts, we see a church that is persecuted. And if we didn't see verse 4, we could begin to assume that these believers started to hide because they had been scattered. They had, be, they had been sent away from their homes. However, there's a power that begins to move here. And, and it says that all the believers except for the apostles. In other words, all the, all the followers of Christ except for their pastors and their leaders were scattered. And they were the ones who were preaching the word. And because of the preaching of this word, the good news of Jesus, wherever they went, there was a plentiful and fruitful result. See, the, the Lord had to allow this persecution. He allowed it. So that believers would step into discomfort to preach the good news of Jesus. This ought to be good news for us as a community, but also individually. Because there is something that is revealed here, and that is that uncomfortable circumstances, no matter what they are, can always be a catalyst for a powerful move of Jesus. 
It, it is about how you respond to these uncomfortable circumstances. And the way that you respond to uncomfortable circumstances, the way that you respond to persecution or to pain or problems says a lot more about your faith than it does about the reason for the persecution or the pain or the problems. Because it's, if we react by being scattered and hiding, what we're saying is, we are resting or having faith in our own power, and our own power cannot face this. But when trials come, when persecution comes, when pain comes, when problems come, and we stand strong and we continue to preach the good news of Jesus, we are saying, and it's not by might, it is by his power. It is not by this body or this flesh, it is by his mighty spirit that we can face this. Amen? And so I don't know what you're facing this morning. I don't know if you're coming out of a difficult season or in the midst of a difficult season or going into a difficult season. But no matter what, life is full of difficult seasons and uncomfortable seasons. Seasons full of pain and problems. I want you to understand that that difficult season, that region of discomfort can be a catalyst for a powerful movement of Jesus in your life. Amen? Amen. Tell the person next to you that pain can be a catalyst. In other words, a starter for something good if you react in the same way that the church reacted to this persecution. Now, going back to a more communal approach, it can also be said, I believe, that the church grows faster during times of pain and persecution. See, for all the strategies that we have in the American church and all the formulas of how to grow a church and how to go from 50 to 200 and how to go from 200 to 500 and how to break the 500 barrier so that you can get to 1,000 by painting the walls this way, by hiring this type of stuff, by doing all this stuff, for all the strategies that we put in the American church, the church will go faster in the midst of pain and persecution. I know that gives me chills to think of that because I don't want to face pain or persecution. But it's the example that we see in the word, that the more persecution came, the more the church grew. And we cannot be Christ followers who keep our faiths to ourselves. If we go through lives as Christ followers, not really caring that other people are dying without Jesus, then we lose our faith. Amen? It's not only about your painful situation, it's about the painful reality of a world lost without Jesus. And it's about the fact that God can use your painful situation, whatever it is, for his glory. So other people can know him and receive forgiveness and be with him for eternity. See, I, I, think, I think the Lord keeps us here so that heaven can be bigger. In other words, so that he can use us to proclaim his word in a way that other people would know him. And whatever your situation is, whether you feel stuck or you feel that, the, that life is rushing you forward, God wants to use that so that Jesus can be known. Amen? Now, as a community, we, we uh, are fearing, or some of us are fearing, what is about to come. For example, that as Pastor Mark often says, sometime in the next 10 to 20 or 30 years, we will lose our 501c3 status. In other words, we, we will not be able to be a nonprofit anymore. And that over time, we will begin to lose even more benefits. I see it in other regions of the U.S. For example, here in Arkansas, for me to be a, a, a pastor, I have to be ordained. And I carry a card that allows me to go into certain prisons or certain hospitals when most people couldn't go. But there are other regions where they're over that. So, for example, in South Florida, South Florida where we were before coming to Arkansas, uh, pastors can't get into any of those places that, that they can get into here in Arkansas. For example, I went to see somebody who was in prison, and I pulled out my business card, thinking that I was all that. And the guy looked at me and said, you can be a pastor all you want, but you're not getting in this prison unless you're a lawyer. And I'm like, I, I used to be a lawyer. I could have gotten in this. <laughs> it's already happening in other places in this country that, as a church, we're losing our benefits. And as believers, we tend to get scared about that and freak out. However, what if we were to be a community that is expecting that and knowing that the greater the persecution, the greater the growth of the church? That the greater the persecution, the greater our opportunities. That the greater the persecution, the greater our chance to grow in our faith and to stand strong and to know Jesus better. Because in brokenness, you get to know Jesus more than in peace. In fact, A.W. Tozer said it like this. 
It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until, until he has hurt him deeply. Let me repeat that again. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. See, this hurt, this brokenness is something that can come to us by way of pain, by way of persecution, by way of problems. But you ought to know and understand that every single um, hero of the faith has met Jesus in brokenness and has used that brokenness as a catalyst for growth. And, and a way for us to understand it or to remember it is, is, is by saying pain and persecution often precede promotion. That if we want to grow in our faith, if we want to grow in our lives, if we want to continue to see more and more of the movement of God and we're facing a, an uncomfortable situation or a, a season of pain or problems, that God can use that to promote us onto the next season in our lives. And it may be a season where your knowledge of him is greater. Maybe a season where you go from just being a follower to being somebody who's desperately in need of Jesus so much that you cannot go a day without him. It may be a season where you get opportunities to tell so many people about Jesus through your story, what he has done in your life, that they can come to know him because of your pain, because of your persecution. That's the next level that I'm talking about. The pain and persecution precede those kinds of blessings. And it's the same thing that we see in the church. The church grows under persecution, not just individually, but also as a congregation, as a community, as a group of people. In China, for example, by 1949, there were only about half a million believers. In the coming decades after that, the government began to enact regulations and rules against Christ followers that they could not live their faith unless they would do so in the way that was dictated by the government. However, in the midst of that suppression, the population of Christ followers has grown to more than 60 million people in a place where they're not even worried about the things that we are worried about. In Iran, for example, the evangelical population is, gr is growing annually at a rate of 19%. In Afghanistan, that same rate is about 16%. These are places where we don't, don't imagine um, huge buildings with a lot of production. These are places where people desperately in need of Jesus know that this is a matter of life or death. And when you make it a matter of life or death, you begin to shine light unto others. Amen? I see it also in South America. In, in Colombia, the nation where my parents are from, uh, there used to be a, a lot less believers before uh, what's called the drug wars of the 70s and 80s. And now you see millions of them everywhere, even in government. And I believe the same thing can happen in my home country right now in the midst of all that pain that people will be uh, finding Jesus and growing in their faith in him. See, um, uh, Matthew Henry, a Bible commentator said, uh, um, though persecution must not drive us from our work, it may send us to work elsewhere. In other words, that though persecution would come our way and it should not stop us from doing what we are supposed to do and called to do and love to do, we need to allow that to scatter us and to send us where God wants us to go so that we can be in the center of his will proclaiming his name. Now, often we think of the center of his will as, as a safe place to be, a place where there is uh, provision, a place where everything is at our reach, but not necessarily See, the Bible doesn't necessarily teach us about safety as much as it teaches us about surrender. And that the calling of Jesus, when we are in the center of it, could be one of the most dangerous places on earth. I took that idea from Pastor Erwin McManus out in L.A. who says the center of the will of God is the most dangerous place to be. Because it may cost you your life, but it may mean life for others. See, we can't be afraid of persecution, church. When persecution comes, we have to be ready. We have to expect the unexpected. We have to know that if persecution comes, then a move from God is coming too. That if pain is coming, that we are sure to see him move and provide blessings and be louder in our lives. That when pain comes, he can use that as a catalyst for his power and his movement and his redemption in our lives and others. Amen? 
Now, it says that they preached the good news of Jesus wherever they went. And it seems to me that it is appropriate to mention that as they were being scattered, they would not stop to gather. We will see over the next few chapters in the book of Acts that believers or churches were planted, and they were planted in gatherings or assemblies or ecclesia churches, but that they would continue to be scattered throughout the Roman Empire and throughout the, the ends of the earth so that other people could come to know him. See, I believe that the church breathes. It breathes in and it breathes out. It gathers and scatters. The church is both. We are not an organization, we're organism. We're an organism because we are the body of Jesus. We are the bride. And this bride sometimes gathers, like on Sunday mornings, and brings us together, and then scatters and sends us into the mission field. It breathes in and takes in people, and then it breathes out. This is why you see people having different seasons in their life, especially when they become leaders. This is why, for example, uh, the season of a pastor will end and he'll move on like we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Or another, other pastors come in like you've seen in the example of Pastor Kai or even myself. And even with that, I am an interim pastor here. We are all interim leaders. We're all interim pastors because our seasons may last a few years. It may last a few decades. Eventually, they will end unless the Lord returns when we're in the flesh, when we're in this generation. And hopefully it can be so. But see, this is what the church does because the, the Lord takes those who grow and those he invests in and, the, and those he, uh, that, that he sees as faithful. And, and he gives people different seasons, different places so that the word can be preached. Uh, for me, for example, I, I don't claim to preach the word because of merit. It really is sheer calling. But I got to be honest with you, the, this country and this calling has taken me into a region that initially was a region of discomfort because this was not my language. This was not my people. But he called me and all of us to make disciples of all nations. Amen. Amen. And so he calls us forward. He gathers and he scatters. We keep reading verse 5 that Philip went to the city of Samaria. Everybody say Samaria. Samaria. You just cussed in Hebrew and, and, or Aramaic. And told the people there about the Messiah. This is very important because Philip wasn't telling people about Philip. Philip wasn't telling people about the church in Jerusalem. He wasn't telling people about a past victory. He was telling them about a future redemption and a present grace, which is the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. That's what we are to be sharing with people. And this same man went into a group of people that were different than him, and he shared that with them. And it says that the crowds listened to Philip because they were eager to do two things, to hear his message and to see the miraculous signs that he did. See, they heard the message and they saw the signs. They heard the message and they saw the signs. Can we say the same thing about our lives? Are we able to go into this world and to preach a message or to speak a message or to convey the message of the gospel, also allowing people to see the work of God in our lives? And I'm not just talking about the miraculous. I am talking about the fruits of the Spirit of Galatians 5. The, the peace and the gentleness and the self-control and the love. Are we able to show people with our lives the gospel? Yo, some, sometimes for some people... Your life will be the best sermon they will ever hear. And if that sermon is not well put together, and if your life is not bearing fruit, that then we'll only be able to hear, but they will not be able to see the work of God in your life. Because these signs were meant for a reason. These signs were meant to point people towards something, and that is Jesus. We need to allow the Spirit to lead us to speak the message and to let the message be seen in our lives. We continue reading in verse 9. Now the author, Luke, is taking us from a grand idea that these people were scattered into the very first example of going into a region of discomfort and how discomfort was heightened by obstacles. A man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. 
That ought to be the first red flag. When somebody claims to be great all on their own, it's not always because they're Latin like me. Sometimes there's something going on. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God, that people were seeing so much in him that they were saying or they were calling him akin to God. He was usurping a name that wasn't his name to take. And they listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. Have you ever seen people who are more vocal about miraculous works than about the work of Jesus on the cross? And it's not that uh, the power of God is annulled or that it doesn't exist. It's about the fact that sometimes we take a place that is not ours and we begin to manipulate people with gimmicks. My son, for example, he's a three-year-old. He thinks that I have the power to eat limbs. Like this. He, he thinks that I can go to him and take his, his, his fingers and eat them. And then he gets really sad. Or he thinks that I'm able to take his nose and then I show it to him like this and I go, mmm, that was delicious but slimy. And he gets so sad because I'm eating his nose. And then I bribe him with that and I go, if you don't want me to eat your nose again, then go pick up your toys. <laughs> and there's sometimes people that use faith, that use powers to manipulate people into doing things. When we are followers of the most powerful one. And there is no other power that can compete with that. Amen? In fact, I want us to remember it like this. That every gimmick yields to the name of Jesus. Gimmick or substitute. Any substitution will eventually yield to the name of Jesus. We see this in Philippians chapter 2 verses uh, 9 through 11. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. It says this, uh, God elevated Jesus to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above, above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what this means? It means that eventually, no matter what power people have or what name they worship or what identity they have, every knee will bow before Jesus. And every gimmick, every substitute will be taken away. And sometimes we put substitutes and gimmicks even in our own life. We become sorcerers to ourselves. When we ought to eliminate that and show the power of Jesus in his gospel. It says that the people believe Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. And as a result, many men and women were baptized. Now Philip is coming in. And they stop getting distracted by this weird power. And they look at the power of Jesus. They, they hear the gospel and they become baptized. And then Simon himself believed and was baptized and began to follow Philip wherever he went. See, Simon did something good in this moment. This sorcerer. He, he began to use the gospel of Jesus and the power of Jesus as beacons. That allowed him to follow in the direction of these people who were proclaiming Jesus. That's something that we can do when we hear the gospel and we see his powers. We can use that as beacons that allow us to move forward and to go in a very specific direction. But it also ought to allow us to see gimmicks and substitutes as something that we have to get rid of in our lives. Sometimes we're just so desperate for resolution we're just so desperate for an answer we're so desperate for something new that we rely on anything that comes our way there was a man in miami his name was jose luis de jesus miranda and he claimed to be the reincarnation of jesus which is weird because his name was de jesus which is jesus in spanish he wasn't the jesus though only his name and, and it was so weird that he would uh, reinvent or redefine the interpretation of the original text. And so, for example, he would tell his followers that, that they had to tattoo the number 666 because that actually meant chosen by, by him. Imagine, imagine a church service where, where this guy was at. And instead of singing, you know, to, to the spirit of Jesus, people were just basically singing to him. And there were millions of people who followed him. Why do you think millions of people followed him? Because people are looking for hope. People are looking for resolution. People are looking for power in the wrong places. Let me tell you what happened to him. 
Eventually, he was sued by his ex-wife, remarried, divorced, got sued again, two ex-wives. That can't be easy. And then later on, he got cancer and began to lose weight and to look sick and would come on Facebook or on YouTube and would talk to his followers saying, the reason that you see me skinnier is because I'm losing weight for you. This is my own power on my own body that I'm getting fit so that you can follow me. But he's dead. He's in the tomb. And he's not risen. Does that make sense? There is no power that he would have had that outperforms the power of the resurrection because that dude is in the grave. But our Jesus is alive and is no longer in the grave. And that is the reason for our faith is the fact that a God who decided to come to this earth and to come into a region of discomfort, leaving his, his, his position of authority, gave his life for us and then defeated death so that you and I could be forgiven and receive grace. That's why he's no longer in the tomb. That's why I believe no one else other than the one who did come back from the dead and who is here today. However, uh, this Simon went back to his old ways. We keep reading in verse 18 that when he saw the spirit was, that was given to the apostles and they laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy his power. Oh, Simon, so cute and so stupid. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But P Peter replied, May your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you and your evil thoughts. For I can see that you're full of bitter jealousy and that you are held captive by sin. Why do you think Simon was filled with jealousy? It's because he was using this power to gain position and acceptance. And sometimes we use the power that we see in the movement of God, in the movement of Jesus in our lives, to gain acceptance, to gain reputation, to gain fame. And we may not be like Simon looking for other uh, gods or looking for a power elsewhere, but we are like him when, when we boast about what we know of the Lord, when we boast about what he's given to us, and we make it ours when it is not. And the reason we do so is for acceptance. But we don't have to fight for acceptance when we know the one who loves us. See, we can't fall into manipulation of the power of Jesus. Because the power of Jesus is not for manipulation, it's for affirmation. The power of Jesus affirms our God. It doesn't affirm me, it affirms that he died for me. It doesn't affirm my identity, it affirms the identity that he has given me. It doesn't affirm me as greater than anyone else, it affirms him as greater than anything else. Amen? And this is why I mentioned earlier, my wife and I, 10 years without having kids, and I could go into detail some other time, and then the Lord has given us two blessings. And, and you know what? I say that not because of me, obviously, but because of what Jesus can do in your life. And, and even though these two kids are the greatest gift that I could have received along with my wife, there's still a greater gift that is greater than my family, greater than the love I feel for her and the love that I feel for them, which is the salvation that he's given me. And if he were to give us nothing else, that ought to be a testimony. And so he is giving you a testimony. He is allowing you to bear fruit. And we can't allow our Christian faith and our gifts to be a reason for popularity or acceptance. But to be a fruit of a life that is compelled by the gospel. Are we compelled by the gospel so much that we just let the, f f the fruit uh, be born so that others can see and hear or so that we can gain reputation and acceptance? It ought to be the former, not the latter. In fact, we see that uh, Simon exclaimed, 
pray to the Lord for me that these terrible things that you have said will not happen to me. There was repentance. And imagine these people who were called out of their region of comfort into a region of discomfort, and they see these obstacles of having to show these people what the real power of God is, and they are able to, able to move on in their scattering to continue to preach the word of Jesus. Verse 25, after testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, and they stopped in many Samaritan villages along the way to preach the good news. They went into those regions of discomfort and they preached the good news. And they did it in synagogues and they did it in the marketplace and they did it by the river and they did it, uh, it, it, it to the slaves and to the wealthy and to the poor and to, uh, and to the foreigners and to the nationals and they preached the word to everybody. And it's the example that is set for us. Yo, when we get distracted by our pain or our persecution, and by the way, when, when I say persecution, it doesn't compare to what other believers are experiencing right now. But let's call it that just for now. That when we are distracted by trouble, by problems, by persecution, by division, by offenses, by emotions, the devil wins. But when we don't let that be a distraction and let that be an environment where Jesus can move, even if we are in a region of discomfort, then we're going to see great things happen. Amen. I see, for example, uh, every Tuesday, I see people who come into a region of discomfort to serve those who are in need. And I'm thinking particularly of, of, of Richard Shade that I see on Tuesdays when I'm here, your husband who is, just in case you forgot, <laughs> who gets in front of dozens of people, sometimes in the hundreds, and he tells them, we serve you right now because Jesus loves you. Amen. Amen. Did you know that the, the inner city, by the way, is one of the greatest mission fields of our time? Because the growth of the church in the inner city in America is in the negative 4%. Meanwhile, the church persecuted in China is growing by the millions. It means that we are in a mission field church. And we ought to serve where we are and testify the name of Jesus. And I say all this by way of saying the following. Do not, do not, do not get scared when persecution comes, when problems come, when you are taken from a region of comfort into a region of discomfort because Jesus is going to use that if you let him, if you're faithful, if you follow him in holiness for the proclamation of his name and for his purposes in your life so that he can be glorified and others can know him. Amen. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you for your power and that we can worship you in freedom. Thank you for your word that nourishes our soul. May we always, always, always point to you, Jesus, Son of God, resurrected and sent. Amen and amen. God bless you.